In 2005, Tamara Agnew was working as an executive assistant in a law firm in Edinburgh. It was a good job, but she knew that there was more waiting for her. She had a young daughter and a strong yearning to be a great role model for her, to show her daughter it was possible to choose and change, to create your path, the life that you want. And so Tamara went back to university as a mature age student and discovered the benefits of having lived before she chose to study. In this conversation, Tamara and I discuss her experiences and her choices for future study beyond her undergraduate degree and the paths and opportunities this has opened up for her. We hope you enjoy this conversation. My name is Angela Raspis. I'm a business mentor, author, and self-worth educator, and you're listening to Your Next Chapter, a podcast about change and challenges, goals, and dreams, and the mix of strategy and self-worth it takes to step into the next version of you. Tamara, thank you so much for spending your time with us. You're welcome. So I love to go back in time a little to dig down into how you were describing when I was reading through your bio, how, you know, when I left school, I really didn't know. I didn't want to go into another learning contract, as you described it, in terms of further education. So where did you end up? Tell us the story before you suddenly decided to go back. So I left school and I did apply to university um, and I got into a degree, which was computer science, which in those days probably would have been very the very kind of beginnings of computer science. And if I'd continued, maybe I'd be, you know, very wealthy by now. But I didn't, and I just didn't see myself in that world. I'm much more a social person. And I just couldn't imagine how computer science could be social. Having worked in digital health since, I do know it's social. So it was just that, uh, what my idea of what it was. Um, So I decided to just, I went to um, college in Sydney and did a, diploma in hospitality management um, and because my parents said well you have to do something so I did that and then I started working in hospitality um, which was fun as a you know 19 year old but I just I was I needed a day job (laughs) because it was very much a nighttime job so from there I moved into working in offices and I had no experience of working in offices at all. I had only my hospitality training, which does serve you very well, I have to say, in terms of customer um, customer relationships. But I moved into office work and eventually moved into working as an executive assistant in law firms. Previous to that, I was working in uh, a small publishing company um, as an office manager. So I had worked my way through from customer relations through to kind of office manager and I've had some pretty interesting jobs in Sydney. Um, but I just, and then I went into the legal setting because I, <laughs> because I knew that you got paid a little bit more. <laughs> so that was my reasoning <laughs> for heading down that route. Um, and by the time, so I lived in Sydney for 10 years. I went to school in Sydney, lived in Sydney for 10 years after I finished school, met my then boyfriend who was from Glasgow and moved to Scotland with him. Wow. So there was lots of movements around there. And did you find when you were moving through those those different jobs and different occupations that was there something that really called you to each one or was it a little bit of happenstance? Yeah, I, I think it was just happenstance. Um, there was a couple of jobs there where I just knew that there was an opening and, and it was a friend of a friend. So I, I kind of, I did, I mean, I went through interview processes as well. I mean, I'm trying to think now how many jobs I've had prior to. Uh, there's like at least half a dozen, at least, um, and in in the kind of office space. like, And, uh, yeah, they, they were, they just sort of, I rolled in from job to job. I didn't, I was never really unemployed. Um, I just, I needed to have an income. I was single and I was share in a share house and I needed to contribute. So I, I did, there was nothing really specific that called me there. I was very lucky though, because some of them were really interesting spaces working in, in publishing or working in, um, a small college in Sydney as well. So there was a few kind of interesting roles that taught me a lot about, admin and taught me a lot about um, how to manage my day and how to manage priorities and um, especially competing priorities. So I did learn a lot 
and that's served me very well now for where I am now. Oh, those are definitely skills that they're, they're life skills, and they are. <laughs> When I look back in time and think about when I arrived in Australia, fresh off the plane at 19, with no mm-hmm. idea what I was going to get up to, and happenstance happened to me as well, and I fell into the field of marketing, and then I did some study at um, at TAFE in the evenings because I thought, well, I've got to have something because I hadn't done uni when I was back in New Zealand, and I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder for a long time of not, you know, I only had you know a diploma from TAFE as opposed to this highfalutin degree from somewhere that you know was going to be bestow its laurels upon me and you know, mm. all those stories I had in the back of my mind. But I think it happens to a lot of us is that we fall into opportunities rather than actively seek them out. But I also like to think, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, that nothing we've ever learned or experienced is wasted. No, I don't think it is. Uh, there's so many skills that you learn working in office spaces, having to work with people, having, you know, having to be able to work as part of a team, but also work independently, having to, you know, manage your priorities. And as an executive assistant, you've got to manage other people's priorities as well. So there's definitely, I, I don't regret any of that. And I, I certainly, mm-hmm. yeah, don't regret not actually doing much study at that stage because I was also. <laughs> a party girl. (laughs) I I mean, I loved going out. I loved um, going to live music um, when music, live music scene in Sydney was a a thing in the nineties. And I just, I just really just enjoyed myself. I wanted, I went to boarding school. So I suppose that first 10 years out of school to me was just freedom. Yeah. That Mm -hmm. makes, that makes sense to me that that concept of freedom of being in such contrast to the rigors and the rules and the constraints and the parameters that we were, we were stuck in before that. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. So let's, so let's move along in time then. The, the last position that you were in or the last, um, office environment was in that law um, mm-hmm. industry and mm-hmm. when did it start to creep up on you that you know what this this is nice this is a good job and it's ticks a lot of the boxes but there's something more how did that start happening and what did that feel like well I suppose it was at that stage that I sort of started to realize that there was a difference between the haves and have nots you know the people that have degrees and the people that don't um, and that it didn't bother me at first, um, but it did. This it did start to bother me. So I was working in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, and it was a big corporate law firm, um, and and there was a real feeling of us and them about about it. And I and I didn't enjoy it that much. Although the people that I worked with were really nice, really good people, um, like in the admin kind of pool of of staff um but then i i had no intentions of changing at and but then i got pregnant so not only did I, was i a mature age student i was also a, a mature mum for the first child so I, I fell pregnant and had my first child when i was 33 and when she was born i had 12 months maternity leave because that that's what they have in scotland um and I, I, in, during that year, as well as being kind of like really loving time with my daughter, but also feeling like I, I didn't have anything to say to my husband at the end of the day, because when you're at home by yourself with a baby, there's, I felt like there was no conversation. I also realized I didn't want to go back to my previous life. I wanted, mm. I, I had this baby and I wanted to be more for her. And I also wanted to be more available to her as well. And I thought, that by studying something would give me the freedom to sort of work for myself. Um, And that was sort of the idea that got me started on thinking about changing my path. That one makes sense so much to me. I remember when I had my son that I was 30 and my daughter, I was 30. 33 or 34, I forget. But Mm -hmm. um, that feeling as though I'd stepped out of the world and um, that feeling that, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't able to contribute to conversation in the same way. There's Mm -hmm. a whole, there is a whole another conversation here around identity and who we see ourselves as, as we're changing roles or adding more roles to um, to the arena. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to that, that point that you were at and recognizing that or believing and thinking and expanding your thinking that perhaps if I had a qualification, in this area, it might allow me to have that freedom and flexibility that's now important to me as a mother. Mm-hmm. And I, I think you also made reference to role modeling as well when I was reading the background. Can you yes. talk to me about that? Yeah. So um, my mum didn't work. Well, my mum was a partner in my father's business, um, but she but it was like a 
a named partner. It wasn't really, she didn't, she didn't work. She, she occasionally worked. And that was that era where I, so it was a bit different and I'm not judging that. Um, but I, she, she couldn't really contribute to my, um, like career. I don't know. I don't know how to say it, but it's sort of like the, she didn't have that experience to be able to give to me and to role model to me. And I just thought, I think I want something different for my kids. Um, and so, and I wanted to be the role model that I think that they, well, that I wanted to be for them. I, I don't know whether I'm the role model they need, but certainly um, I've role modeled something for them. <laughs> Well, I think what we're what we're role modeling, or what I'm seeing in your story, is that you're role modeling the ability to choose what feels right for you, to be able to change direction, to mm-hmm. recognize when the thing that you've got is not the right fit for you, and it is possible rather than just to accept it and keep moving forward to change the game plan. Yeah, definitely. And that that's I think that's a really powerful role modeling for our for our kids. You yeah. know, I know I actually share an office now at home with my daughter who is at uni. She is studying now. My my son is finished and mm-hmm. and we are going backwards and forwards. She's actually, funnily enough, is studying event management at okay. a place called ICMS. And mm-hmm. I did a lot of events back in my days when I was doing sponsorships and events for a newspaper. Mm-hmm. And she's seen me well, she didn't see me when I was at work because I left when I had my son and started my own thing for many of the same reasons you're talking about, that desire for flexibility and freedom. And she's seen me both having a past but being able to choose what it is that I want to do going forward. And I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Whether it is going back to study, I mean, she actually put down on her uh, an assignment she was doing a couple of weeks ago, her five-year goal is to open her own events business. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you go, girl. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So it's. I think it's important for us to show our kids yes that we've got choices Mm -hmm. so so here you are making like mulling over this recognizing that you don't want the old path you want to build a new path so Mm -hmm. what happened then what sort of options became available study began to open but you didn't go and study law so talk to us about no (laughs) the choices you made i can't see that law you can't be a well you could be a lone wolf practitioner i suppose but it's not not to start with in law, but um, I had always been interested in kind of complementary healthcare, um, and there was a degree at Edinburgh Napier University that that provided a good, well-rounded degree. It wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't focused on everything that is good about it. It's, it was a very broad and open degree, and um, I had always had an interest in essential oils. Um, so I followed that path to understand what essential oils were um, and I thought this was going to be something that I could do at home, from home um, and work around, you know, set up a, a set up so that Millie could go to daycare some days and, and I could be at home other days with her. So that was my plan. I felt like that was my best option at that stage. I wasn't still feeling overly confident about my ability to actually do it. Um, I had a very big hangover from school that I wasn't good enough and I wasn't smart enough. Um, And so I kind of went down this avenue because I was just because I was interested in it and I could see that it could possibly lead to working for myself. And I mean, I'm glad I did. Um, I learned a lot, but um, I had phoned up the university to find out a little bit more and they called me back and my husband was in the room when they phoned me back and I didn't think that he would be too keen for me to do this. I think that he would probably have wanted me to go out back to work again. Um, and I kind of went, Oh no, I don't think I can do it. And I hung up the phone and then Alan said, what was that about? And I told him, he's like, well, just do it. <laughs> like literally just do it. I, he, I could in, in Scotland because I'd lived there for so long. I was a permanent resident and I could have, I, I didn't have to pay fees. You don't have to pay for fees in, in an undergraduate degree in Scotland. That's it. I'm moving to Scotland. <laughs> yeah, that's what my daughter says. Um, and uh, yeah, so I I went. Okay, well, you know, if I don't like it, I can I can leave. So I started, and um, and I, they, that was the start of the journey. And so, in a way, it was my husband's sort of gentle nudge to just do it. That um, is what really really forced me to to just go grab a, 
by the horns and yeah. And the take them forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, we t- I often talk about um, to clients and on other podcast episodes as well about the value of a belief buddy. And in this instance, that's what your husband was for you. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes we just need that little push. We mm-hmm. borrow somebody else's belief in ourselves until we then develop it for ourselves. Totally. That, and that he knew push. I was not happy. He, he yeah. knew I wasn't happy where I was. I mean, not that I was unhappy, but he just knew that I was, there was felt more. a bit stuck. Yeah. yeah, there was more available to you. Mm-hmm. And I think this is probably one of the, the, the biggest feelings in my head is that when we have the suspicion that there is more that is potentially available for us, if we don't explore it, we're really disappointed in ourselves down the track. Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You don't want to be lying on your deathbed going, God, I wish I did that degree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting that when you talked about that hangover from school of, of feeling just not good enough or smart enough, that is one of the central, what I call misbeliefs. It's one of the stories that we can carry around so much, but mm-hmm. you managed to move through that and take action anyway. Did mm-hmm. you make, have some sort of, you know, um, peacemaker discussion with your inner voice that said, okay, Go and sit in the corner. I'm getting on with this. How did you move through that doubt? Um, well, the first assessment that I had to submit, I think, was uh, anatomy and physiology. And I was not feeling overly confident in my kind of biology area skills and, and academic writing. But I ended up getting 94%. And that was the first assessment I got back. And I was just so excited. And I kind of suddenly felt like I could do this. Yeah. Um, and I think that was probably the moment that I went, hang on a second, all these skills that I got working in law, uh, you know, writing and, and writing, academic writing is different to legal law writing, but it's not so dissimilar. Um, and and plus the skills I had at reading and, and I, I suppose I just realised suddenly I had a lot of skills that were useful and that I could yeah. actually do something and be successful. And I, I can't, I think that day I was, I think I nearly fell out of my chair when I got that paper back. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I was just really happy. And, and it just, that was that, I think that was the moment I got the confidence I, and I found confidence. And as well as that being a mature age student in, in a class, uh, in a lecture was pretty helpful because it real, I realized that I did know stuff. Yeah. That's actually one that I wanted to jump, jump in on and ask you that about how it felt to be in the atmosphere of you know, here's the youth and, and here's I as rather mature. <laughs> <laughs> so did that did that feel strange at all? Um, well, yeah, but fortunately I've got quite a young face. <laughs> so people didn't realise how old I was. <laughs> so that was a good thing. But yeah, I did find um, uh, that I was I kind of I, I think it really I mean, I, I'm thinking about this also from the perspective of being a lecturer and being a tutor now um, and knowing what I know from the perspective of being the tutor, that um, the, the the mature age students generally hold court in when you're having class discussions. There were times when I would go, okay, today I'm not going to speak in this tutorial because I feel like I'm overtaking everything and I don't give anybody else a chance. But then when I was quiet, nobody else spoke. So I realized that it would take me to kind of start talking to give everybody else the confidence to be able to put up their hand and contribute to a conversation. So, um, yeah, I think it made a big difference being a mature age student. It also helped that I had worked in the world for 16 years and I hadn't reached anywhere that I was completely happy. And so when I had an opportunity to learn, I really took it. Whereas a lot of students who were coming straight from school or who hadn't had that opportunity to work and live in the world um, as an independent person didn't really have that same experience and drive. Yeah. And, And I notice it now too as a tutor and lecturer as well. So there's lots of positives for being a mature age student. I love that thought of you actually acting as a catalyst mm-hmm. within a tutorial. I, and I've got this feeling that, and I can't put this down to pure experience because I haven't gone back yet, little asterisks, as a mature mm-hmm. age student because one of my highest values is is lifelong learning. I, could, I just love learning stuff, mm-hmm. new things. Mm-hmm. But to be able to act as a catalyst and to realize that your life experience can actually allow you to to be bigger, bolder, brighter, absorb more of what's going on. And because, braver. And braver. Your head's in a different yeah. place, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. And even if I think, even if you didn't get that, you know, 94 on the first assessment, which is an awesome, like, hurrah, yep. an, an awesome amount, but it's also that you made a choice in terms of the degree, the path that really connected with you as yeah. opposed to the one that, well, I guess this looks good without really having the knowledge when you're younger. I mean, some people are very blessed and they know, you know, for the day that they're born that this is my path and off they yep. go, hallelujah. Yep. But for a lot of us, it's like a happenstance like we talked about. Yep. So do, you, do you feel that having the autonomy and the self-efficacy to say, this is what I'm interested in, I'm going to pursue this, mm-hmm. actually enhances the overall experience as well? I think so. Um, I mean, it was, it's a very controversial re- uh, learning area in, in the world of academia because um, many people think it's got no evidence. And, you know, I could go into that, but it's a whole different podcast. Um, but uh, I, I think that I was confident enough and brave enough to sort of want to learn it and, and be outspoken about it. So I think that helped a bit. It does. I think if something is aligned with your values, your nature, your beliefs, Mm -hmm. the thing that you want to stand up and talk about in the world, then, yeah, it would be a lot easier to have the conversations around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So so we got the undergraduate degree, but wait, Mm -hmm. there's more. Tell me about what happened next. Well, there is more. So in um, 2010, I graduated my husband so that was that was kind of the real credit crunch time in the UK and everything went pear-shaped um and I had graduated so it was a three-year degree my husband had to move back to Australia because he's in the construction area and it's in Scotland that just ground to a complete halt and we were we had no income so he came to Australia to work which was kind of more buoyant and I stayed in the UK and the university offered my daughter to pay my daughter's daycare fees because she was four a hundred percent of them which really said you know we want you to do an honours so I did my honours degree and learned a lot about research um and 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 it was just one of those things that I got I got research you know, like there's a lot of, you know, people get other stuff, but I got research. And so I did my honours degree. I was very, very fortunate that I had the support that, support that I did from my husband um, and from, from you know, the university to pay her fees. Um, and so, and I've got a first class honours degree, which was another kind of moment where I went, hang on a second, actually, I can do this. So I came back to Australia uh, in 2011 or ish, no, 2010, no, 2010, I came back to Australia, um, moved to Adelaide and applied to do a PhD at the University of South Australia um, and got accepted. So that was my next step. I I decided to keep studying, (laughs) which is is not everyone, maybe people would think you're a bit nuts for doing that, but it's, it was just my, it felt like, it felt like a natural progression to, to continue in research because what I realised, there is not a great deal of evidence in complementary medicine. And so I wanted to contribute to that to create and to also, I don't, I'm really um, want to make sure that when people spend their hard earned money on something, it's something that's got a good evidence base. So that was my goal was to be able to do research in that area and get into research in that area. Um, and that's my still my goal I suppose and that see that's perfect this is this idea whether I'm encouraging somebody to to find the business core that aligns with them or or listening to someone like yourself who is finding the academic path that you know allows them to pursue that passion Mm -hmm. it has to be aligned with with your own values with what's most important to you otherwise it's not going to be sustainable I mean if Mm -hmm. you were doing a PhD in a completely different subject you probably wouldn't have done the PhD but if you found that thing that lights you up you found that thing that makes you want to stand on your soapbox and share it you found that thing where there is a gap in the world that Mm -hmm. you are are uniquely you know equipped to fulfill I often talk about and actually in the the wee book I wrote last year it's the idea that there is a I didn't put your name but just take it this way there's Mm -hmm. a tamara shaped hole in the universe and Mm -hmm. only you can fit that hole yeah and so that's what you're doing you're pursuing the thing that is calling you and that is always not not without its hurdles (laughs) to get Mm -hmm. over but it 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 always pulls us forward do you feel yes it really does Mm -hmm. and that was i suppose what what drove me i was 39 when i started my phd which was 
you know, it's not that old. There's a lot of older people that start their PhDs much older in life. And then there was a whole lot of people that I was doing my PhD in the, in the same school and college um, that were much younger than me. Um, and, but it was a, a, such a brilliant opportunity. PhDs are flexible, very flexible opportunities to, of learning, um, even though, and it's not, it's not learn actually, and you're not a student, although you are called a student, you really are working, you're earning money, like you paid a scholarship to be able to do this research. Um, and so it is, it's a job and, and I was in the right job the right job for you and you can hear mm-hmm. it in your you can hear it in your voice mm-hmm. yes, it's the conviction in your voice which um which makes that very obvious so what's what's coming next what is the next chapter now that we have this this new way of you know finding that evidence for complementary medicine how are you using that out in the world now well I mean, <laughs> COVID has thrown a very <laughs> large spanner in the works. Um, the universities, <laughs> yeah, universities are have. There's been a huge purge of university staff because they just can't support them. So I think that there's been upwards of ten thousand job losses yeah. in the university sector. So that's made life very challenging. Um, however. That not having uh, so I work across three three universities, um, and just working from home, which is that I suppose that's one of the plus um, plus sides of, of COVID is it's made people be confident that people can work on their own yeah, and remotely. Um, but I've also learned that even, and, and that the, the uh, as much as I love the university working in it, working with like-minded people, um, really open, uh, open, thinking kind of people, the structure of universities is getting harder and harder and much more competitive. And, and I'm f- nearly 50 and I just, I'm, I had a second baby during my PhD who's now eight. And I just, I don't want to get back into that, into that zone of not being completely happy because of the, the structure rather than the people and the work, which is probably where I was when I was working at the, the law firm. Um, so I've kind of my next step. So I've I've set up a, um, a consultancy with my PhD supervisor, who is a, an associate professor at Southern Cross University now. And so we're sort of working towards being able to work with businesses um, and do research and, and education and 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 work consultancy work across businesses as well as um, I'm. I've created my own podcast, which hey. is um, <laughs> which is called Career Sessions, and the aim of that is to it's it's targeted at high school students and probably gra- uh, graduate university graduates wondering what happens next. So the first series was a series of um, interviewing people with PhDs to talk about a research path, and we've got some ideas for the next couple of series um, of what's going to happen. But basically, it is targeted at at that group of people to talk about exactly what we're saying, what we've talked about here is that it is a massive decision to make at 17 and it's not necessarily one that I don't think that people know that you can have seven career changes in your life, that what you choose at 17 is not necessarily the be all and end all and you don't have to feel disappointed and you don't have to feel so stressed and it's interesting because I've, my oldest daughter now is 16 and, and she's sort of going into that, what do I do next? And I went, you just don't, don't. Firstly, don't panic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, that's that's really where we're going at the moment. There's, I feel just, it's, I feel like I'm quite, it's quite an opportunity to be creative with what I what I know about research and what I and this kind of burning desire to be a little bit entrepreneurial. Yeah, it sounds like there's a beautiful combination of them Mm -hmm. that you've worked on both sides. And I think this is probably the thing that is most important to us as mature women. I can describe us thus. Mm -hmm. It's not freedom that we necessarily want. It's flexibility. It's for for us to be able to work our work around our life, not Mm -hmm. have, have that work like commandeer our life. Mm -hmm. And that entrepreneurial side is looking for opportunities that align with you. Mm-hmm. The ones that feel good. I've always felt that if we are doing the work that, again, allows us to have those soapbox moments, uh, soapbox moments, allows us to pursue an agenda, which might sound like a strange way of describing it, but an agenda mm-hmm. that aligns with our heart. 
Mm-hmm. There has to be the heart, but there has to be the head. You've got to bring the head along as well. Yeah, the yeah. two can, the two are a force to be reckoned with when they're when they're combined well. Yes, it, it's you know this idea of all these career changes. A lot of the people who are listening to this podcast have their own businesses, and there's you know what you're moving into now into your next chapter with a consultancy setup. But I read a, a book a, a wee a wee while ago by a couple of guys from Stanford who champion design thinking but then are using it to help you and and young people design their lives in terms of recognizing that you were going to change several times and exactly as you were saying it's not a problem mm-hmm. and it's the same thing that happens in businesses as well like i've mm-hmm. been doing my own thing since 2003 if what i'm does what i'm doing now is it completely different yes but the threads are still there mm-hmm. there are still commonalities so it comes back to what we were saying before that nothing is ever wasted correct so, so someone that's thinking okay can I go back there? Can I go and be a student? It sounds like the number one thing to understand is that you've got life experience now, which is actually going to really aid you. But, but number two, you've got to make the choice that really aligns with you, not the one that you should think you, think you should do. Exactly. There's a, the, the going back to university as a mature age student is a really uh, an enlightening experience. It's so, um, uh, it really makes you feel good. It makes you, you learn so much about yourself and you learn so much about what you can do. And if you've ever doubted what you can do, then university, if that's your, if that, if you're that way inclined and learning is your thing, university is a real opportunity to learn a lot about something, but also learn a lot about yourself. And I think it's really important. It's, and um, it gave me a lot of confidence, a lot of confidence. And I just think, you know, we're busy we have busy lives. Everyone has a busy life. Everyone's always, oh, I'm busy. Um, so it's led me to a point where I can go, yep, I'm really focused on my children. Um, and I'm also very focused on my career path, whatever that, however that meanders. Um, and that the university degrees have given me the freedom and the flexibility to do, be good at both. And what more could we ask for in our next chapter? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful full circle. Tamara, thank you for this this insight and especially that idea is that being a catalyst within those conversations and tutorials and that at uni. And, and in fact, I think sitting in, in my mind and perhaps in other people's minds as well was probably feeling maybe I'd be really awkward when I'm there. Like I'm not really in the right place because I'm not 17 or 18, but mm-hmm. you blow and let one out of the water. Yeah, yep. blowing that one out of the water in terms of that. If, if this is something that you're curious about, maybe you need a belief buddy to sort of push you over the line a little, mm-hmm. but go, go and Darwin will explore it. Go exactly. and see. And if you're feeling that excitement inside when you're exploring it, that's a sign. Like that's the body barometer saying, God, yes, please step forward. Let's do this thing. Absolutely. And you totally will not be the only mature age student on campus. I can absolutely assure you of that. <laughs> it's definitely more of a trend, which is fabulous. Yes. Hey, well, what I'd like to, like I'm asking all my guests at the moment as we come full circle, I'm asking them around um, what's a song that really, a song or two that we can add to the next chapter playlist that really it lifts you up or or it says something about where you are and where you're going. And the same with a couple of books. Like Both of those are great resources. So what do you have to share with us? So I was thinking about this um, before you before we started chatting about the songs. And I, I, like I said, I love music. It's always yeah. been a massive part of my life. And I was thinking about what songs meant. And Nina Cherry's song, Woman, has always been on my playlist and has always been a favourite. But as I get older, I kind of, the words just resonate with me a whole lot more. Um, and I think as well, being the mum of two daughters uh, yeah. has also made a big difference in what that what the words mean to me. And, and basically, it's a song. It's like strong. Yeah. And I feel strong. And that's, that's uh, one song that I find to be sort of reflective in, in like, and not in lots of different ways, but <laughs> the, the words just, uh, they're just meaningful for me. And you also said about songs that kind of, I think something about, in, you know, giving you energy. Yeah. <laughs> and I always think about the days where I'm feeling very kind of low energy and, and I need a little bit of a pump up. And there's a song called Size of a Cow by a band called The Wonder Stuff. And it's just basically saying, you know, you've had bad days, but, you know, none of your problems are as big as you think they are. So just get on with it. Well, <laughs> and that's, I, a, and I, lo- I love like, the sound of that. Yeah. Sort of, you can bounce around and 
energize yourself. Well, at least I do. Um, it's also very useful when you're cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon music is one of the best ways to, to shift your mood really fast. Yes. yes yeah, that's what this, I use it for. This song does that for me. And books, I don't, like I have said previously to you, I don't really read inspirational books because um, I like people's stories, which is why I podcast. And um, But I have read two books recently, which are kind of meaningful in that they – they, for me, they were about women. So the two, I read a lot of nonfiction mm-hmm. and the two books I've read recently, one is called Eggshell Skull by Brie Lee and another is called Emotional Female by Yumiko Kadota. Um, they're both Australian and they, uh, Brie studied law and Yumiko studied medicine and was going to be a surgeon and it's about their, their journeys, different paths, but sort of both of them started on a path and have since both left um, – that path. So Bree's left law. I think she might be doing a PhD in in legal somehow. Um, and Yumiko has left medicine, um, uh, or she's like gotten off that path a little bit. And what I like about both of them, the stories are quite harrowing. It's not they're not easy reads, I have to say. But the both of them have been, and I've read their kind of online stuff. And both of those girls are really successful in their own way. And I suppose what I got from it was that these girls had done something and they just completely changed. And so it's not just the book, but the the story of what I've read beyond the books about these girls that really kind of inspires me. And I think I can, I can do things. And so, yeah, but as I said, the stories are quite harrowing. They're they're heavy stories. Um, But, but the book, the, the, the people that wrote the books are really quite interesting to me. Mm, I love stories as well, just getting inside people's heads, funnily mm-hmm. enough, when you said eggshell skull. But there's, I mean, I love the stories behind the faces and that's mm-hmm. one of the things what you, which you and I spoke about before we hit record is that the people that I love most to speak to on this podcast or speak with, have a conversation with, are people like you and me, people mm-hmm. who our, our stories are accessible. We can see, you know, possibility an inspiration in someone's story and they don't have to have, you know, got all the way to Antarctica alone or, you know, been to the moon or, you know, whatever. It's mm-hmm. just that the strength here is that seeing that there's another possibility mm-hmm. and screwing up your, color, your courage and stepping into it. And so I reckon those stories that you're sharing there with those books will be really worthwhile reading as well. Well, both of those girls had to step into their courage big, big time. Mm. So, and that I suppose is also quite inspirational that they, yeah. they, they had that courage and they did it. And it took them some time and they, but they got there in the end. So it was quite, it is for that reason. They're both really, I highly recommend both of them if people like nonfiction. Brilliant. Well, I'll make sure that the, not only are the songs added to the Your Next Chapter Inspiration playlist, but also those books will be on your podcast page once we go live. Excellent. Well, Madani, thank you so much for spending your time here. I guess the last thing I'd like to ask you is I want you to imagine that there is somebody who is listening to this episode now and they've got that little kernel of sort of like, hey, maybe I can do it. Maybe it's an option. Maybe, maybe, maybe. What mm-hmm. would you say to that person who was sort of oscillating at the moment to encourage them to, to step forward? I would say, I mean, the, the obvious thing is to just do it because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's like when you get a haircut, right? <laughs> You're so scared about what it's going to look like, but your hair grows back. And I say this to my child, my daughters all the time, your hair grows back. It's like you, you can take a step. And if it's not right when you get there, then you just, you just step back off it and you find your other step. It's not, it's not, you don't have to finish something because you started it. Yeah. Uh, that's my philosophy around books. If I can't get into the book in the first few chapters, I put it aside because life's too short. Um, but the, the training and, and career paths, is, there's nothing there's nothing that says once you're there, you have to keep going. And the other thing about if you're choosing university is there's m- many, many ways to change paths in university. It's hard to navigate until you're actually there and you're speaking to people who know. Um, but if you choose a Bachelor of Science degree and you're not happy, but you can see that maybe you're interested in, say, a OT, then you can just navigate to a different path mm. in that scenario so nothing's fixed so just try it just give it a go that's very 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 wise advice and i appreciate you sharing these perspectives with us they've been really enlightening so thank you so much no worries thank you for having me you're really welcome 
And to you, my lovely listener, can you hear that? The, the wisdom in what Tamara has shared today. Just take the first step. You know, who knows what's going to happen next? But we have to be in motion so that other opportunities and possibilities start to come into our radar. Like the whole idea is that our doubt dissolves in action. And you just never know the company that you might be keeping with other mature age students as well. If you decide to step down that path and pursue what is interesting you, what is fascinating you, what might give you another way to be in the world. Now, I, as I said before, lifelong learner and possibly university is in the future for me as well because of that desire. And perhaps it's there for you too. So the purpose of this podcast podcast was to open that door of, po- of possibility for you and let's see what happens if you choose to walk through it so thank you for your time listening to our conversation and until we're back take very good care 